Okay. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to our first ever Changing Planet webinar. Uh, as always, this, um, this webinar has been organized by students from the Science and Solutions for a Changing Planet Doctoral Training Partnership at Imperial College London. Uh, this event is being recorded, and the video will be shared with participants and on social media uh, soon after the event. The seminar today is being given by Ms. Linnea Lapala, a doctoral candidate in social and moral philosophy at the University of Helsinki and a former Grantham Institute staff member. Lynn's going to start her seminar soon, but first I just want to go through some features of uh, Zoom and some other things for the seminar. I know some of you might be familiar with Zoom already, so um, please just be patient with, uh, <coughs> with this is just, just while we go through it. Uh, firstly, I've muted um, all participants to allow, <coughs> uh, to avoid the disruption, disruption in the seminar today. So if I can ask you to keep yourself muted uh, and also if you keep your videos off during the seminar. If you wish to ask a question uh, during the event, you can either send your question directly to me on the chat function and I can ask it on your behalf in the sort of first Q&A, or you can wait until the end of the seminar and I'll unmute you so you can uh, ask it yourself. Um, I've set the chat so the messages will only be sent to the hosts, which is me and the speaker. So if just you type your question in the chat box and press enter and it'll come through to us and I'll kind of go through them during the seminar, so, so send them at any point. Um, please state your name, your affiliation, and your location ahead of the question, uh, if you're okay for me to say this to the audience, and keep your questions you know, on the brief side if possible. Um, if you want to give any seminar, any feedback during the seminar, you can either use the uh, participants tab buttons to give us a thumbs up or thumbs down, or you can send longer feedback uh, to me in the chat, like I say. Um, we understand this is an opportunity for, you, for some of you to catch up with people on the course, and our colleagues and friends. So after the Q&A, what we'll do is we'll allow everyone to unmute if they want, and you can stay for a free discussion um, and networking opportunity. Uh, and Lynn will stay for a bit during this part, um, but we'll close the overall session at, at 5.30. And if you look on your screen now, you should be able to see um, a, a, a timetable for the, for the seminar. If you have any uh, connectivity issues during, during the seminar, if you could first try and reset your connection by leaving the Zoom call and re-entering, that should work. Um, but if that doesn't work, you still have connection issues, then send me a message in the chat and that'll help me know if this is the kind of wider issue which we need to find some kind of fix for. And, and finally, if you're tweeting about the event and want to share your thoughts, you can use the hashtag ecoethics, which again is on the slide you should see. And you can tag the Grantham Institute and Lynn, you can see their uh, details on the slide as well. Um, and also, I'll, I'll paste the relevant details into the chat in a minute. Uh, we always like to see kind of a good, a good photo, even if we can't hold our events in person, we can still you know, share, share what we're doing. Um, a reminder for anyone who missed the start, uh, that this event is being recorded and the video will be shared with everyone soon and on the Grantham Institute's uh, social media in the, in the next few days. And uh, that's all for me. So I'll, I'll share this information in the chat for everyone who missed any of it. And uh, I'll now pass it over to Lynn. I hope everyone enjoys, enjoys the event. So just a quick reminder, everyone, if, you, if um, you could turn your video off and everyone should be muted um, just so that we can kind of get, get it flowing smoothly. So I'll hand over to Lynn now. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Chris, for the introduction and hello to everyone. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in, especially during this very difficult time. I hope you are all well and safe. So I know that my title, uh, oh yeah, oh, let me just change. So I know my title, oh, Chris, do you know why I have this squiggle on my screen? Um, I, I don't know why you have this squiggle on your screen. Maybe you have to go out of presentation mode and go in again. You might have to do that. Yeah, I'm going to stop share. So, sorry about that. No worries. So, uh, oh. Yeah, so sorry, I have this. Maybe if you stop, maybe you stop sharing your screen and go back again. To yeah, it. thanks. Apologies, everyone. No worries, we always have these kind of teaching problems in the background. <laughs> oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. Apologies about that. Uh, so, yeah, as I was saying, my, um, uh, I know that my uh, title is a tiny bit on the uh, 
uh, depressing side today, but I promise you that there will be some hopeful and uplifting remarks. So uh, just a little bit of background about myself. So I'm not your usual uh, Changing Planet seminar series speaker, as I'm not a scientist, but in fact a philosopher in training. So, um, so one of the cool features about philosophy is that you can pretty much examine any area of research. So I feel very privileged today to be able to talk to you about ecological restoration, which I will be referring to as restoration during, during the duration of this talk. So, so this is the structure of my talk. So at first I will be doing a very uh, brief introduction to what ecological restoration is. And uh, I will keep this very short because I want to focus instead on the ethical arguments. And then also I'm uh, not an expert on restoration ecology myself. And also then I will be following by looking at what is philosophy and specifically what is environmental ethics. And then I will be exploring the moral landscape of ecological restoration, which I will be doing through the moral garden of a forked path, which I hope will illuminate some of the many of the ethical arguments that lie within restoration. So, uh, reports we've heard like reports after reports how the de about the devastating bits of our current environment. And this is by new, uh, not, I'm sure, not news to many, uh, any of you. But even though it's not a great time for nature, it is quite an exciting time for restoration at the moment. So one of the most recent uh, developments was in the beginning of 2019, the UN declared the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration, uh, spanning from 2021 to the year 2030. And this is a huge global initiative that aims to prevent and reverse the degradation of ecosystems worldwide, worldwide as it's stated by its tagline. So this decade corresponds to the 2 billion hectares that have been identified as being in a degraded state and in the need, for, and su in the need and suitable for restoration. So ecological restoration has been defined by e Society for Ecological Restoration as the process of assisting the recovery of an ecosystem that has been degraded, damaged or destroyed. And finding this kind of universal definition for something as complex as restoration can be very demanding. However, I believe that this uh, definition has been very widely uh, used by practitioners. So this is the definition that I will be adopting here in this, in this presentation. So restoration projects can vary uh, by quite a lot. So they can be these very small, local, small scale projects to these absolutely huge and massive restoration projects like the one you can see in the slide at the moment, which is the restoration of the Kissimmee River um, a restoration of the Everglades National Park, which is part of an even bigger restoration project uh, called the Comprehensive Restoration Plan. And this is a multi-billion billion dollar project. So in the before before photo, uh, that's on the left hand side, you can nicely see the kind of uh, original natural state of the system. Whereas in the before photo, in the middle, you can see the degraded state and the altered state by humans where we have attempted to straighten the river. And in the aftershot, you can nicely see what restoration, the restoration attempts to do is to restore the system back to its original condition, return, returning the beautiful meandering curse of the river. So, so when I first started putting together this presentation, I typed into Google philosophy is, and this is basically the search suggestions that came up. So I kind of feel like I need to justify myself a little bit here. So even outside the uh, Google search engine, I quite often find that not that many people, not everyone always knows what philosophy is. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time exploring and explaining just so that we're all on the same page. 
So philosophy is one of those deceptively simple yet extremely elusive concepts. So most of us do have a basic idea of what philosophy is, but it can be very challenging to actually pin down the kind of core and core essence of what philosophy actually is. So one of the potential issues uh, why philosophy has this slightly bad rep might be that um, is nicely demonstrated in this quotation from Robert Send, a writer and poet, where he writes that being a philosopher, I have a problem for every solution. So this kind of understanding of philosophers as problem engineers it might be one of the reasons behind this ne slightly negative um, uh, Google searches. So this kind of portrays philosophers as, as great at raising issues, but not that great at finding solutions. And as being a Finnish, a Finnish person, I just can't not but help bring Moomins into this. So this is a lovely quote from Tuve Anson's book, Comments in Moominland, where the philosopher character Muskrat says, I can work anywhere. It's all a matter of thinking. I sit and think about how unnecessary everything is. So I hope that during this talk, I can convince you that philosophy can actually make a very important contribution to our environmental issues. But what is philosophy then? So uh, the scope of philosophy is absolutely huge. And I think uh, Bertrand Russell in his book, History of Western Philosophy, gives us a good definition or conceptualization of what philosophy is. So he writes, philosophy, as I shall understand the word, is something intermediate between theology and science, a no man's land, uh, uh, exposed to attack from both sides, Almost all the questions of most interest to speculative minds are such as science cannot answer and the confident answers of theologians no longer seem so convincing as they did in former centuries. So, so as I see philosophy, philosophy is this, this, this kind of art of critical thinking and this ability to not only ask but focus on the right type of questions. So philosophy then is kind of can be divided, divided into these four main branches of philosophy, which are metaphysics, which is research into the very reality of uh, very nature of reality, or uh, epistemology, which is the area of philosophy that's focused on theory of knowledge, value theory, which is the study of principles and values, which is the area that and the context of this talk today, and logic, which is the study of reasoning. And all of these studies obviously overlap, so these do not always neatly go into one category or another. But because these fundamental questions can be asked of almost anything, philosophy's uh, scope potentially becomes absolutely huge because we have these applied areas of philosophy, of which I am talking to you about today, which is environmental philosophy, which is one of them. So, um, so I hope that uh, when, if we remind ourselves of some of the critical quotes we, I mentioned earlier, so one of the key aims of philosophy is actually to provide um, practical force, which, which is ultimately what philosophy is trying to do, is to guide our theoretical thinking and also human action in the world. So hopefully I will be able to um, bring some practical force too. So, whoops. so what about environmental ethics then? So compared to the very long history of uh, philosophy, which spans all the way to ancient Greece, environmental ethics is a relatively new area of philosophy, which has started to form in the early 1970s. So environmental philosophy analyzes a whole host of issues that emerge from the relationship and interactions between humans and the non-human nature. And the key question that opens the door to environmental, philosophy, environmental ethics is why nature or natural entities have been kept outside our moral realm and theorizing. So to put some of the key issues of, um, to, to key aims of environmental philosophy, uh, environmental ethics tries to, and this is a quote, provide us with a language with effective arguments whereby we can claim that some kinds of actions are right or wrong, or at least better or worse, independent, independently of their co 
of their cultural or legal context. And end of quote. And this is a quote from Andrew Light and Ralston, or Holmes Ralston. And the second aim of environmental philosophy is to evaluate the scope of uh, evaluate the scope of ethics and and as some environmental ethicists claim, the arbitrary preference to human interests and human issues that have, have dominated philosophy. So much of the work environmental ethics then is to devoted to expanding the area of our moral concern to also include non-human uh, entities. So if we then move on to the moral landscape of ecological restoration. So what I'm sketching here is not an exhaustive map of what the landscape actually looks like, but I hope it will display the moral variety of restoration and the importance of thinking about these issues ethically. So some might disagree a little bit the way I've been uh, mapping them, but that's partly because it's quite difficult to map these theories uh, neatly into a, into a simplified map. So what I'm illustrating in this, in, what I'm il illustrating, I'm using, um, uh, my illustration is basically inspired by this short story by, the, by uh, Georges-Louis Borges, apologies for my horrendous pronunciation, which is called the Garden of Forking Paths. So I'm just taking this very basic idea of the Garden of Forking Paths, but I won't actually, uh, that's where all the similarities end. So what I aim to show is how the decisions that we take with restoration will commit us to certain paths uh, with some specific ethical consequences. So what I hope that this example will tease, tease out and demonstrate is the range of ethical implications that emerge from the practice of restoration and when we go uh, beyond the scientific narrative. So here's the list uh, of some conceptualizations and arguments that have been put forward by philosophers and ecologists about ecological restoration. And, and this is, uh, I've only included the ones that actually include some sort of uh, philosophical or moral dimension. So I'm only going to be able to focus on some of these uh, theories and arguments. Uh, unfortunately, due to time constraints, I won't be able to explore all of them. But I hope that this kind of list demonstrates the, the huge moral ground that there is to cover with restoration. So let's start our virtual journey through this moral garden of forking paths. So our starting point is the degraded, damaged or destroyed natural area. And of course, the details of how the damage occurred, by whom, etc., all matters to our ethical evaluation. However, I will keep this um, very abstract and very broad um, so that we can explore as many examples as possible. So we have two options for us. So we have the intrinsic value path, which is promoted by many environmental ethicists, ethic, ethics theories. So this considers nature or natural entities as being um, valuable in and it in and of themselves. So they, uh, so nature or natural entities are considered as direct objects of our moral consideration. So these, uh, so nature is then not seen valuable because it's valuable to us humans, although these um, reasons are of course important too, but because it's valuable uh, without reference to anything else. The other path that we have is an instrumental, of, of instrumental value. So here nature is thought of having instrumental, only instrumental value. So nature in itself is not considered valuable, uh, but instead the things that nature provides us, for example, resources or recreational opportunities um, make it valuable. So here nature is not directly valuable. So let's explore the instrumental path first. So the classic case here um, has been raised against um, restoration. One of the classic criticisms has been put forward by Robert Elliot, who's a philosopher. And he attacks that restoration, he attacks restoration because he is worried that restoration is being used as an argument to undermine preservationist principles. 
So if nature is considered replaceable, which we can restore to our heart's content, we lose the very important arguments and justifications for the preservation of nature. So the, very, so the worry is that environmental damage can be then justified by the later promise of restoration. So this is what actually uh, Eliot calls the restoration um, thesis. Um, so Eliot actually considers that nature is something that cannot be restored. And this is because what we value in nature is its naturalness and because it's natural to a very high degree. So naturalness is something that Eliot uh, defines as unmodified by human activity. And this therefore means that by definition, naturalness defies restoration. So this then uh, leads uh, Elliot to conclude that restored nature is in fact faking nature. And he examine, explores or illustrates this uh, in more depth with an example of an art forgery. So let's, uh, I'll use my own example of, of this. So in the same way that history and genesis of a famous painting affects our evaluations of it, history and genesis matters when we value nature. So if we illustrate with an example of the painting Mona Lisa. So this paint, Mona Lisa was painted by Leonardo da Vinci himself with these specific artistic um, styles, with the specific strokes that uh, da Vinci decided to take in the political and cultural environment uh, in which he and the historical context in which he lived and all of these important all of this information then adds up to the value of the painting of Mona Lisa so let's imagine now that we go into Louvre uh, to see Mona Lisa and what we find out that what they actually have up there is not Mona Lisa at all but an exact replica and in the same way as an exact replica of Mona Lisa being a fake Eliot argues that so is restored landscape and I'm sure like if we went to we wouldn't see these massive queues in front of um, Mona Lisa as I saw when I went to see it myself if it was uh, the, uh, the fake that's up there so let's continue with art forgery example. So what I think is ultimately behind many of these criticisms that many environmental philosophers, philosophers have, have made against restoration is this idea that restorations actually look like this. So this is, if you're unaware, is Mr. Bean's attempt to restore the famous painting of Whistler's mother in the film. Um, which was uh, create the, the original painting was created by James McNeil Whistler. So here the problem is that when humans try and restore nature, we leave a clear human mark that is inferior to the original, even though an untrained eye we might not be able to see this, but this mark still exists. And another problem is that this mark necessarily devalues the original. Or, and as in some cases, as uh, for example, um, Eric Higgs argues, completely destroys the value of the original. So then I want to go to the next path, which has been explored by the philosopher Eric Higgs, which is called the technological restoration. Unfortunately, I won't have enough time to go into the full details of this uh, theory because it's, it gets quite complicated as it goes into Albert Workman's uh, theory of philosophy of uh, technology. But I hope that even a simplified version will bring out these important aspects of uh, technological restoration. So technological restoration is this highly professional and technological type of restoration. So it's this uh, non-inclusive and it's a restoration that is geared toward efficiency. So it's this like hyper corporate way of environmental management. So as Higgs writes, um, under technological restoration, and this is a quote, ecosystems could be rebuilt or fixed without increasingly costly commitments to environmental protection. Uh, end of quote. And many of, in, in technological restoration, many of the meaningful human nature encounters have been stripped away. 
So the one of the worries that technological restoration might lead to free, freak landscapes. And freak landscapes are these regions that have been extensively altered from their original natural state. And the very big worry is that um, technological restoration might lead, might lead to hyper-reality. So let me ex uh, explore hyper-reality with an example. So Higgs and her, his colleague Jennifer Seifer wanted to understand what would lie at the very extreme end of technological restoration. And the example they came up with is Disney's Wilderness Lodge. So hyperreality is this term again borrowed from a philosopher, Albert Berkman, who argues that reality in this highly technological setting gives way to hyperreality, which is a kind of reality that is detached from their, from their direct experience and context with the world. So a wilderness, uh, Disney's Wilderness Lodge is a great example of this complete transformation of a place that is inspired by human, human ideals of nature and wilderness. So uh, if you're unaware, the Disney's Wilderness Lo Lodge is located in uh, Orlando, Florida, US. It's one of the 13 themed luxury Disney resorts. And, it, and the lodge, uh, in itself appears to have been built from stone and wood but the reality is something quite different because it's all made, made out of uh, mold, carefully molded concrete that has been painted. Even the rocks outside have been made from molded concrete where all the lichen, the stains, the moss have been carefully painted so that they would look realistic. And the centerpiece of the park is uh, in the center is this fire rock geyser, which isn't actually a real geyser at all, but it is a water theater that erupts like clockwork every hour. It's basically this natural wonder that you don't have to wait for. So nothing, nothing in this uh, lodge is as it first seems. So the outcome is a hyper reality which provides Disney's customers with this tamed sense of wilderness experience without any mud, any hassle, any danger. So what Disney is doing with its wilderness lodge is that what Higgs and Cypher describe the colonization of imagination. And the worry is that Disney's version, if Disney's version of nature becomes the primary reference for our experiences in nature and not the other way around, that's when we are in real trouble, according to Higgs. So this is particularly troubling as Higgs highlights that when you really think about it, Disney's Wilderness Lodge actually doesn't have anything to do with nature or wilderness at all. It's all about what humans want and desire. So these are the two types of restoration I will look at in the instrumental side. There are other two that I unfortunately was unable to look at. However, the take home message is that the instrumental path completely ignores many of the ethical arguments that have been raised about, for, by environmental ethicists that could lead to some quite devastating outcomes as we saw hyper-reality pathway. So we then go to to, to the intrinsic side. So here Higgs also, Higgs also uh, presents a positive account of restoration, which he calls focal restoration. So focal restoration resists the pathway towards technological restoration because it centers on reality and local participation and relies on what Higgs calls focal practices. So focal practices are these interconnections between a person, a thing and the environment. So they require a lot of attention that are aimed towards learning, usually learning a skill that can be developed, leading to competence and excellence. And these practices can then end up producing focal things. So focal things are these things that we really value. So for example, learning to play a musical instrument or cooking could potentially be good examples of focal practices. So focal practices and focal things then lead to this kind of meaningful engagement with the world. So Higgs sees restoration as a potential type of focal practice. 
So according to Hicks, vocality then is an antidote towards the technological restoration route, which is caused by the commodification of nature by technological restoration, that technological restoration pathway leads to. So what would the focal restoration then look like? So focal restorations require repairing the damage, designing interventions that re uh, reconstitute ecological integrity and requires treating ecosystems as valuable things rather than instrument instrumental things for human consumption. So these can then have um, um, can help bring, uh, build stronger relationships between people and natural processes and thereby could, could act as help, uh, could help us mend the human nature relationships. And my final example of the intrinsic pathway is that of restoration as moral repair. So the focus is directed towards moral wrongs here that have occurred in the initial destruction of, na of a particular area. So the idea is that moral wrongs demands to be rectified. So we could Im imagine that when we destroy nature, uh, it leaves behind a moral debt that will linger until satisfactory action has been um, uh, taken to deal with it. So restorations in this sense could be used as a form of moral repair to get rid of these moral debts. An example I will be talking about is John Bassel's restitutive restoration. And according to restitutive restoration, um, uh, it's this kind of more, uh, more, uh, more sufficiently deals with the moral uh, wrongs that occur when in restoration activities. So restitution is a very common feature in our courtrooms. However, um, it's also a very common part of our ethical frameworks too. Uh, so how we, we respond to moral misconduct. So Basil defines restitution, and this is a quote, as the act of making right in response to making wrong, end of quote. So restoration could serve as a form of restitution, as long as restoration has what he calls a remediative requirement. So it is not enough that we simply compensate for the damage, but we must also ensure that the moral wrong is not repeated again. So the remediative requirements kind of uh, tackles this issue of character dispositions of the person who have co committed the harm and the grounding reasons why the harm happened in the first place. So let me illustrate this with an example um, uh, that I've kind of made, made up well, by inspired by John Bassel's examples. So here we have uh, Nige. And then we have Jessica, and here's Jessica's house. And then Nige sets fire to Jessica's house. And here, this is clearly Nige's fault. However, Nige being a good guy, knowing how to undo the harm, he will compensate Jessica by rebuilding Jessica a new house. Everything has been nice, done and dusted. However, he sets the Jessica's house on fire again. And it's clearly, again, Nige's fault. However, Nige, being a good guy, apparently, he will rebuild the house again. So the compensation has been done. Um, so everything's good. However, he sets the fire back on again, again being his fault. And this kind of um, pattern continues. So there's clearly something wrong with Nige. So specifically in a moral sense, so Nige has satisfied the requirement to repay Jessica. However, the remediative requirement in this example has not been satisfied. So here Basel for refocuses our attention from the actual wrongdoing to the wrongdoer. So this move allows our attention to focus on Nige's dispositions, habits and outlook. And if a moral wrong is continuously repeated, it will most likely arrive not from the, uh, from the given circumstances, but actually from something much deeper within the agent. So attention must therefore be paid to the wrongdoer's character dispositions that are causing the wrongdoing in the first place. 
So here we have the other positive accounts that I was unable to explore. And what my PhD is trying to do basically is I am trying to create a moral framework for restoration that would pretend uh, that could provide some guidance on how restoration could be conducted in a way that it avoids um, the, me the many criticisms that environmental philosophers have raised, the ones that we've, we saw on the intrinsic value side. So a lot of my work happens on this, uh, in, sorry, instrumental side um, where all the um, criticisms happened. So a lot of my work actually focuses on the intrinsic value side. So, uh, and one thing I've been focusing on recently um, is this thing called what I've termed rights-based restoration, which focuses on the idea of rights of nature and seeing how, whether having, if we considered that nature had moral rights, how this would actually affect our restoration practices. However, however this is in very much in working progress, so I won't go into detail. Um, and here we have it, the moral landscape of restor ecological restoration. So I hope I've managed to show the different uh, forms that restoration might take depending on the pathway we choose to travel. So a lot of um, the ethical uh, uh, side of the restoration debate has focused on how much and what kind of human inter intervention is appropriate and gaining a kind of better understanding of the ethical consequences that ecological restoration might have. And even though environmental ethics has been quite critical of restoration, it is deep down rooted in this worry that restoration will ignore these important intrinsic values of nature. And when, we, uh, when nature is seen as a mere source of instrumental values, um, we often struggle to see the structures of domination and uh, structures of destruction and domination that's going on uh, at the background that has made uh, restoration such an important tool for environmental management. So the decade of ecosystem restoration that UN has started uh, will be starting next year is a result of this broken relationships that humans have with nature. So I'm hopeful that restoration uh, as restoration is developing as a field, it would provide some room to include these important ethical findings to make restoration more meaningful, valuable and sustainable practice, both ecologically and ethically speaking. So I just want to conclude with a lovely quote from Aldo Leopold, who's uh, the father of um, ecological restoration and very incidentally the father of um, uh, environmental ethics are actually one of the founding fathers of environmental ethics. So he writes, I have read many definitions of what is a conservationist and written not a few myself, but I suspect uh, that the best one is written not with a pen, but with an ax. It is a matter of what man thinks while about while, uh, thinks about while chopping or while deciding what to chop. A conservationist is one who is humbly aware that with each stroke he is writing his signature on the face of his land. Uh, thank you very much for listening and I very much look forward to their questions. Okay, fantastic, thank you Lynn. Um, th and thanks everyone for, for listening and thank you for the questions that people have sent me. Um, so what I will do now is I will read out some of the questions that have been sent to me during the talk mm -hmm. and if people keep on um, posting them in, in the chat then they will come through to me and I can sort of you know, uh, read them out to Lynn and then after that uh, we can transition to if people want to raise their hand which you could do on the participation tab then I can go to you and I can unmute you and you can ask the question uh, yourself if you'd like but we'll start with a question which I've had from Ewan Furness, an ICL student from Argyll, and they say, in the case of restoration as moral repair, couldn't repayment for the moral wrong include not just repair, e.g. building a house, but repaying resulting costs, e.g. Inconvenient, inconvenience caused by burning a house down, or in the case of nature rather than knowledge, the pyromaniac, costs in terms of ecosystem services? 
And if it did include this, wouldn't repayment always be axiomatically sufficient to focus on the individual is, would then be unnecessary? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I, was, I mean, my, my example was very simple. Yeah, it doesn't need to be that Nige himself actually rebuilt the house himself. So it can be uh, like, for example, um, giving the uh, appropriate amount of money to Jessica to rebuild the house. It doesn't really matter how the, yeah, the repayment can be done in many ways. It doesn't always necessarily mean that if I, obviously, like in the, if we take a, Real world example, obviously, I am responsible towards the law of environmental damage uh, indirectly. So it's not always doesn't mean that I have to go in and uh, do some restoration work in Africa, for example. So I could, for example, donate some money towards charity and help towards this restoration work this way. So the means aren't necessarily that important. Or they are important, but they are definitely um, uh, it can be sufficient to uh, to um, to abide by the reparative requirement by a whole host of different ways. However, the point is that if we kind of keep on uh, repeating the harm, that we haven't really conducted the moral repayment. So we can't just justify because then it appears that we are kind of justifying the harm by later repayments. So that's what the Basel example tries to tackle is that uh, tries to kind of cut off that route so you cannot justify the moral, act, moral harm. So um, that's the kind of point of the argument. So it tries to stop that route. So, and I think that's one of the key issues with environmental harm in the beginning is that I think we need to do some, as a humanity as a whole, we need to do some soul searching into why, why all this harm is happening in the first place. Although as a caveat, I have to say that obviously some form of harm is necessary because we, can't, we do need to use nature. But at the moment, there's a lot of literature on like, uh, on like um, there's a, there was a great article on, for example, modest greed is that a lot of the stuff that we actually consume is not could be titled as greedy uh, and in a modest sense so it's not necessarily that necessary what we're always uh, always uh, consuming so some of the harm isn't very well justified. Sure thanks Lim. Uh, we have a question as well from, from Henny a PhD student at Imperial Institute of Zoology and she says to which degree does the moral landscape of restoration depend on a clear human nature dichotomy as in, would it change a lot if there could be situations in which people could be thought of as an intrinsic, legitimate components of ecosystems? Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a really great question. So, yeah, the dichotomy thing is a very, very important uh, one, and one that philosophy, uh, environmental philosophers recently spend a lot of time on. So, I, even though, like the um, Eliots and for example, cats in the instrumental side of my thing, they they create clearly this uh, dichotomy between uh, this kind of division between humans and nature. However, um, I uh, I think that this isn't always that helpful, and that there are indeed ways that we could consider nature um, kind of um, we could consider uh, ways of um, kind of um, do a restoration could potentially be a way in which we kind of can em almost embed ourselves within nature when we restore. However, this again requires some of that ethical background of so that we don't do them from the wrong reasons. And I'm at the moment, um, yeah, trying to figure out how that could be done so that it's uh, theoretically consistent. But yeah, I'm uh, very. Um, uh, very much agree with that kind of that, that that dichotomies can be useful in some sense but ultimately if we want to start treating nature um, ethically I think we need to also find these ways where we don't create a dichotomy between humans and nature. Sure thanks. Um, we have a question from Theo who says hi Lynn fantastic stuff 
Given the incredible propensity of nature to regenerate itself, what are your thoughts on leaving ecosystems to regenerate of their own accord? Would this avoid some of the ethical issues that you've raised regarding ecological restoration? Oh, sorry, could you read that again? Sorry, I missed. Sorry. Uh, they say that given the incredible ability of nature to regenerate itself, what are your thoughts on the idea of leaving ecosystems to regenerate by themselves? And would this avoid some of the ethical issues that you've raised regarding restoration? Yeah, yeah, that's a, a good question. Um, yeah, indeed. So, um, so uh, obviously, uh, that does avoid. Um, so, uh, so partly it does kind of avoid many of the issues of kind of how humans then uh, kind of intervene in nature. So, for example, how uh, Elliot sees. Um, um, restoration he kind of seems to be saying that we should probably leave the area and let, and he actually has an example where he kind of thinks that if you do kind of take a step back the naturalness might be able to restore uh, restore the uh, finally be able to restore and the area might become at least somewhat natural if we just take a step back however there's also, I think, the idea of moral uh, moral repair is also important. Is that especially if we have caused the damage, I think it's also important that we, um, in some ways, have to. We can't just kind of, if we imagine nature as a kind of, if we see a bleeding, uh, if we run over someone with a car, we kind of feel like we should try and help them and take them to the doctor or something and in kind of that kind of similar way I feel like when we have caused a lot of damage we are also responsible for the harm and in that sense it's also important that we actively do something to to um, restore however there might there could be cases uh, where that could be that we have to take a step, step back in some cases especially if it's in a relatively uh, pris pristine area it might be that we are required to actually take a step back and try and uh, do the moral repair in other ways so that's an important thing to keep in our kind of um, uh, ecological tool toolkit so I think that's a very important comment to make. Yeah. Sure. Thanks Lynn. Um, we have a question with someone asks would you be able to go into a little bit more detail about what a rights-based approach to nature would look like? As in, would this be an extension of animal rights to see intrinsic rights of life to trees and other ecosystems? Yeah, so uh, one of the reasons I kept that very brief is because I'm currently, it's still under construction. So I have changed my mind several times. So I've been, um, but, but yeah, so basically it's, um, kind of expanding uh, the moral rights arguments to include nature and I would there kind of um, I don't necessarily uh, in the in the thing I'm more my main focus is to look at how it would affect the praxis of restoration so I don't necessarily argue for the rights of nature and construct uh, 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 a full theory of rights of nature, which is something that I just simply wouldn't be at the moment <laughs> to do in one. Uh, it's, just, it's hopefully going to be a part of a book chapter, so there's simply not enough space. And, <laughs> and my PhD topic is on something else, so I wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't have time to spend more time on that. But, but the point is that, um, uh, so a lot of my her emphasis is on looking at how restoration might look like on if we took rights of nature seriously. But the, where the rights, where I'm kind of elaborating what these rights might look like, they would be um, I'm at the moment leaning towards the idea that we maybe have some form of interest theory of rights uh, where we take like interest of nature seriously so interest so the rights are based on that we can consider that nature has interests and in a holistic sense because we're talking about restoration i think the the rights needs to be holistic in a sense that they are um uh 
they are rooted in either ecological integrity or e ecosystem health or something like that. But I'm still kind of <laughs> figuring that out, so I won't be able to give a full <laughs> answer at the moment. Sure, yeah, no worries. Thanks. Um, we've had a couple of people who've, who've said is, who've said they found the topic really, really interesting. And they're asking if there are any kind of uh, books or articles that you might be able to recommend that people could, could look at themselves to kind of do further reading into the topic. I think this is probably partly because a lot of people in here, like myself and Vivi, are kind of, you know, working climate change, but from a, like a physical sciences perspective. And so this topic's really interesting to us, but we not necessarily know too much about it. So I don't know if you, if you were able to kind of, off the top of your head, give a couple of things worth looking at looking, uh, if people want to kind of look at this further. And maybe if, you know, we might be able to circulate a short list of a few things to kind of the email list after the seminar even. Yeah, certainly. I'm, I'm obviously more than happy to share a little <laughs> list of literature. So um, uh, one of the books I would really recommend, which is, uh, which I kind of quoted in, um, uh, if it lets me, so it's from my last slide, it's Aldo Leopold, the Sand County Almanac, so that's a really nice one, but it, it's very lovely read, um, it's very beautifully written, and it includes a very nice, uh, so he, in the book, he develops a land ethic, which is this holistic environmental ethics theory, um, so, which includes that, um, where he writes that ethic, kind of a thing is right when it aims towards the kind of beauty and health of an uh, of all kind of living beings and biotic beings. Sorry, I can't remember it by heart, but it's a very beautiful, uh, very beautiful book and includes a lot of like ethical aspects. Although environmental philosophy wasn't fully formed or hasn't, was only kind of starting to develop. So it doesn't really have any of the terminology, but it's a really, really beautiful read. Um, I'm just thinking, uh, there's a whole lot of other books. I can probably send like a uh, compile a more careful um, list if I have a, I think there's a, there's a lot of uh, literature out there, but that's, with restoration, obviously, uh, Robert Elliott's um, uh, uh, Faking Nature is very nice if you're interested in the moral uh, arguments of, um, of, so the original, um, ar ar uh, the, ar the arguments that I used here in this presentation were from an article that he wrote, but this is a kind of whole book version of him elaborating on ecological restoration. And here he actually tiles down a little bit his view, so he's not quite as critical as he is in that art initial art article that I reference in this presentation, but he, this includes a lot of ethical, um, of the ethical arguments quite nicely. Uh, but yeah, there's obviously climate ethics, which is uh, helpful towards Grantham listeners, so, so there's a lot of stuff about the climate ethics, so um, I can do a little literature list. Sure, yeah, I think maybe environmental maybe. ethics. Maybe we'll send, yeah, I think we'll send that out in the, um, yeah, because we have people's emails from the, uh, from the sign up. Um, and also just to remind people that this, this is being recorded and so the video will go up online as well. So if people want to look through Lynn's answers to that question more closely and kind of search for the things that she mentioned, then, then you'll be able to do that. Um, we have a question from Neil Jennings from Grant, from Grant Institute Imperial. He says, how would you consider the moles of the offsetting of aviation emissions from an environmental ethics perspective? e.g. restoring ecosystems in one part of the world to try and balance carbon emissions elsewhere. Yeah, so that's, um, that's a, a great question. So that's obviously the main kind of area under a law of attack from environmental philosophy perspective because if we consider that nature actually has intrinsic value, you cannot really, or it will become quite difficult to justify that kind of uh, mitigation efforts where you can suddenly destroy areas somewhere and then 
um, find somewhere of, of equal ecological value and then compensate by either restoring area there so that becomes quite challenging because if the area in itself is intrinsically valuable then you should really be allowed doing stuff like that so i think that's actually one of the key worries with ecological restoration because you could potentially justify this or you could destroy uh an intact fairly uh, pristine uh, uh, forest for example and use it to uh, for human resources that we obviously also need but then uh, say that it's okay because we're just going to go to this other place somewhere else and just restore the same um, restore a new forest in this area and I think that becomes quite challenging to justify and that's kind of the whole point of these ethical arguments where where uh, uh, ethical the importance of ethical arguments kind of arise where I think it's important that even though potentially could be justified if the needs the needs of humans to do that would need to be significantly great I think in order for us to allow such mitigations um but yeah in general uh, i think that's exactly what these kind of positive environmental ethical approaches are trying to avoid uh, are trying to block is this mitigation efforts sure thanks uh, we have a question from Durange northwood at imperial college and they say in your opinion who is morally responsible for ecological restoration would it be all humans or more the billionaires who've profited the most from its destruction? And they ask, can this moral debt be paid in money or must those responsible get their hands dirty? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a good one. Um, yeah, so, uh, so that's where these things <laughs> get very complicated, is trying to, especially with, uh, with the rights-based restoration that I'm looking at because there you often, need to have duty bearers and rights holders and so on. So you need to be able to point your fingers uh, towards the right people. So here they get, re and with environmental degradation in general, it gets very complicated as with climate change to try and find, and that's something with climate change where um, uh, climate ethics has really struggled to find culpability, like who are the people responsible for these really extremely complex forms of harm, environmental harm that we're producing. So um, a lot of, as I kind of alluded to in this question and answer session, a lot of the I might be responsible partly towards a lot, whole host of damage that have, has occurred around the world, but it's really difficult to find, find to what extent I am responsible. But yeah, that's something that I will spend a little bit of time in my PhD doing is that how, how and how we could find, what kind of uh, ways we could use to find that culpability or or do we have this kind of or is could we cons consider that humanity overall is uh, culpable for environmental harm so but my my probably my my um what is it uh educated guess i suppose at the moment i haven't done the work so but my educated guess is that we could probably point a little bit more fingers towards the people who have more opportunities to actually um to affect the situations so certainly probably these big corporations or big billionaires would have more blood on their hands, so to speak. And also it might be, so some forms might of restoration could potentially require them to make, put their hands dirty. So you could, could have a, I suppose, ethical theory where they're required to do some restoration. But in general, in uh, the ethical, um, literature on ecological restoration, these kind of ideas of community participation in restorations are quite valuable. So in that sense, uh, it's, it would probably be actually quite valuable to try and get these <laughs> billionaires and get their hands dirty and actually directly engaging with nature. But yeah, that's my educated guess. Thanks. Uh, 
Sure, thanks. Um, we have a question. Someone asks what you think about the what you think of the ethics of reintroducing species to countries where they've been extinct for a long time, e.g., uh, wolves into the United Kingdom. Yeah, that's also a, ch a, a good, tricky one. Um, so yeah, so uh, I suppose a lot of these can be done. They, these could be considered, I suppose, restoration projects because it depends on what you have as your like his, your historical reference point. Because wolves used to be part of the um, the ecosystems in the in um, in the UK as well. So uh, my these I find that if Thickly speaking, these uh, reintroduction pro programs aren't as, like we have to obviously take into consideration a whole host of issues, like for example in the UK, the introduction of wolves can be become quite tricky because UK is obviously quite densely populated areas and wolves potentially require quite large large uh, landscapes to roam in, so there might be, so we, we need to make sure that the the introduction is also good for the species and we're not just doing it just for the sake that they used to exist and that we want to try and get the historical uh, original uh, uh, like place as perfect as possible so we need to be able to also justify it from the grounds of the species that they will also be able to flourish and if it looks like UK isn't necessarily a good environment for the wolves. In, I wouldn't say that it would be, at the moment at least, ethically justified. However, in general, I think if a species has been um, um, wiped out in an area and it's uncontroversial either for the society, the human society, and also for the animal or species itself to be relocated, then I think that that's a uh, I think we can definitely, I think ethically, we should try and reintroduce the species. It becomes extremely challenging when we go to the de-extinction um, uh, discussions where should we try and like revive uh, mammoths and revive the uh, passenger pigeons or the species that have does our moral culpability go as far as bringing back extinct species and I think that's where I'm not entirely sure if we do, but if the species already exists, then I think if it's um, ethically justified for the human community and for the species itself, I think we should try and bring that species back. So oh, thanks, very interesting. Um, someone asks, how do we make amends for irreversible damage, such as the extinction of species? So is there any way of doing that? Yeah, so, yeah, so that's, uh, that's also a very, a very tricky one. So, so I suppose obviously we can only do what what we can, and that's something that I will need to spend some time in my PhD thesis looking at. Is that if it's actually completely, or if it's impossible to fully uh, restore the area, how can how can we then? Um, uh, kind of relinquish the moral depth, depth that we have. Um, but there I think we definitely have to do what we can and uh, and for example I think we need to my again educate I haven't done all the work yet so some of these will be <laughs> educated guesses but I think if we are unable to fully restore um, then we have to probably try and uh, kind of um, take some other environmentally positive actions to try and compensate the things that we were unable to do with our initial restoration for example so we would have to do something extra too but obviously we can only do what we can and as Emmanuel Kant said um, yeah you can only what implies can so you can only do what what you can only be obligated to do what you can do. Cool. Okay. Well, th thanks a lot, Lynn. Uh, it's gone. It's gone five o'clock. So we are going to bring this section in, uh, to a close. So sorry to everyone that um, submitted questions. They're all really good questions, but we didn't get time to go through all of them. 
uh, thanks to Lynn especially for for giving this great talk today and and obviously the first the first uh, webinar that we've put on so um, some kind of yeah quite complicated uh, setup we had um, we're now going to move on as as it should say on your screen to a kind of more informal uh, chat if people want to stick around so what I'm going to do is I will allow people to unmute themselves um, and I re recommend turning a video on as well if you want to stick around for a chat. And if Lynn, maybe if you could turn off your screen sharing and then, you know, people can just agree to sort of mingle and, uh, and talk around. I mean, there's still 50 people left uh, in the group. So yeah, if, if people want to stick around for a chat, then feel free to unmute yourselves and, and turn your video on, that should work now. And, uh, and yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks everyone for coming. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, Lynn. <laughs> uh, thank you for the talk. I, I don't seem to be able to open my video, uh, but never mind. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Very interesting. Um, I wasn't sure what to expect. Um, I'm an artist at the RCA who's um, working with waste and degraded materials, but I'm very interested in the whole thing. And having seen the subject matter, I thought I, I wasn't sure what approach you were going to take, but that was mm. very good anyway. Thank you. Ah, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. I really appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, with philosophy, you never know what you're going to get, I suppose. <laughs> well, it's, no, it's interesting. No. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure what angle you were going to take, but that, that's very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, uh, if, if, and, and in case it was um, clear to anyone, I'm, I'm, I am positive towards ecological restoration, but I think we have to be careful in how we conduct it. So mm -hmm. I'm broadly positive. I think we need to find positive ways that we can uh, interact with nature. And I think in with positive um in in the right ways we can ecological restoration can certainly be that positive way yeah yes i agree yes thank you i don't know why my video i'm sorry you can't see me can you i'm sorry okay. <laughs> i don't seem to be able to make it work <laughs> okay hi lynn it's Hello. Emily from Grantham at Imperial. I hope you're keeping really well. It's great to see you and your work progressing and learn uh, some more about it. I know we've chatted a little. Um, in my PhD, I'm looking a little bit at the ethical angle of a conservation project that I've studied. And um, so, I mean, I have so many questions. And I'm going to have to limit myself to one because otherwise it's not fair on everyone else. But um, the one I wanted to talk about was the trade-offs because in undertaking some restoration projects, it could be that some rights users or um, other elements of the ecosystem, whether you count people as part of the ecosystem or not, either way, um, they can be affected or one species might be excluded, so rats being excluded from, if you're restoring Macquarie Island, bird populations or something, we have some value judgments about who has the right to be present in a restored project. The one I'm thinking of is marine protected areas where often what happens might be that the and terrestrial protected areas, the traditional fishers of that area may be excluded temporarily or permanently from fishing in an area to allow restoration either naturally or artificially to be undertaken so we've got a trade-off there and a, a sort of moral dilemma in in our ethical process um, and I this must be something that is talked about in the literature I guess because it's happened so often um, so yeah I just wondered what your perspective was in terms of the framework whether there's an avenue of making, how to help make a, a decision tree of how you make those sorts of trade-offs. Thanks. Yeah, um, yeah, those are obviously the <laughs> very tricky, tricky questions. So kind of um, what I look at with my PhD thesis is kind of how we should deal with ecological restoration. 
and that's kind of I'm trying to form an ethic how we should deal with this uh, specific environmental problem however I in general what, what you kind of describe what you need is kind of a full theory of environmental ethics which then helps to deal with the whole host of ethical issues so um so that's something i'm still kind of personally myself trying to figure out what my full what theory kind of works best for me but i think in um in specific situations uh, i tend to have this kind of more pluralist plur pluralist approach where it kind of depends on your situation so for example when you're conducting restoration i think you should for example have a more holistic view um, of the of um a holistic view of the restoration that you're conducting but then i suppose that's when you have these competing different things um affecting then you might then need a wider pers uh, ethical perspective saying that this thing is wrong and this thing is right so for example um one of the the kind of big main ethical theories are uh, his uh, holistic theory so which takes uh, like um, uh, holistic things so uh, kind of systems as the basic unit of moral value so for example an ecosystem or the biosphere as a whole or then we have biocentrism which looks at that all living entities are intrinsically valuable and that should be taken in consideration so for example a lot of biocentrism would be quite would be at a lot of problems with ecological restoration issues because obviously when you restore you potentially kill animals and and um, specific individuals or species you might even remove entire species so biocentrism becomes quite conflicting with uh, with um, ecological restoration for example but those kind of broader ethical philosophical theories would then give you an answer to your to your problem so it depends on kind of what theory you then prescribe to personally i think i'm a bit more of a i think i'm leaning towards a pluralist that we need a specific theory for a specific problem but yeah i'm still kind of doubling but yeah on that but i don't know sorry i don't have a full answer yet <laughs> i'm still figuring that out more myself <laughs> yeah that's great thanks but yeah you might well yeah if you want to have some help with that you might want to look at the different ethical theories that there that there are and they then give more specific answers to these kind of trade-off problems because they put the what things are of of particular importance have specific value and then you can't kind of at least you try need to try and not override those and it depends on the ethical theory but there might be some that work that the, that are then close to what you're kind of your thinking and that can give you those good um guidelines on how what actions are morally right from that uh, perspective But I think I, I, yeah, I'm a bit between because I think all individual animals and all individual things are valuable. But then at the same time, I tend to have this clearly quite holistic view as well. That I think we can, we need to consider ecosystems, for example, as a whole. So I'm kind of in between these two and I don't quite know how to, which takes precedence basically. And I'm kind of feeling more towards the holistic side that we need to take care of the, the, holi the holistic system first before we can focus then on the individuals. But that is not to say that the individual in animals and individual things aren't important, but that the holistic issues are more important as a whole and should take precedence. Uh, ask a question. Um, Hi, all, Karen. Uh, <laughs> Hi, <Lynn. laughs> uh, Thanks for the talk. It was great. It's good to see you again. Yeah, lovely to see all of you. <laughs> uh, 
Um, I was just wondering, um, so in particularly with regard to the systems that give um, nature an intrinsic value, um, if and how they sort of separate the human, you know, humans being part of nature, um, and you know, under some views, nothing, nothing that we do, even now, necessarily being separate to nature, um, is that valued? And how do you sort of say, well, this part of nature being, you know, this this pristine wilderness is valuable, but it's less valuable now that humans interacted. And how much do you say, well, that's just another part of the natural process? And, and I don't know if that makes sense, but. Yeah, I think I think I know what what you mean. So just yeah, stop me if I'm uh, not answering your question. <laughs> but yeah, so that's one thing I've been kind of uh, another of these issues that I've been doubling with myself. So so we kind of have this I understanding. So we have na so nature is a really frustrating concept. <laughs> um, so uh, the 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 basic way that we kind of tend to understand nature is through these mills, two different definitions of nature. So there's either nature uh, as opposed to um, super supernatural. So basically everything is natural. So humans, our uh, you know factories, everything's natural. Or then nature as opposed to artifactual. So. Uh, yeah, so basically anything that's part of human intentional activity is then not natural. So you kind of, that creates that dichotomy between humans and nature. And I think that kind of two ways of seeing nature, both of them are kind of quite, they don't really fully, I think, <laughs> Uh, describe what we mean by nature. So kind of what I've done, tried to do with my PhD thesis is that we should understand kind of nature as also including um, at least definitely including humans and potentially some activities of humans and then abide to some sort of, you know, fit in nicely with ecological, healthy ecological functioning or something like that. But then um, at the extreme end of that, we have wild, that concept of wilderness. And wilderness is kind of that, that type of nature that creates this dichotomy between humans and nature. And that's the kind of pristine nature, the nature without humans. So that way we can still, because I think I, I really want to keep the important reasons why we should still preserve not highly natural areas. And I think wilderness is a very powerful concept to do that. So that idea of, so I think there are parts of nature where humans probably shouldn't go, that we should just respect the respect the, or that humans might be able to go, but shouldn't maybe dis you know, um, start building roads and stuff like that. So we can maybe visit but kind of the um, US Wilderness Act way so we can uh, visit, but we should not remain. <laughs> so, so I think the wilderness is this kind of, um, yeah, the kind of human-less nature, but it's on this spectrum, but nature in itself kind of allows hum potent at least some human activities and humans into the picture. And that's where I think, uh, because wilderness areas are so rare these days, even if any of they might not even exist anymore, but at least something close to the wilderness uh, concept, they're so rare, I think their value is extremely high at the moment. And that's why I think we need this dichotomy, but I would only preserve it to the concepts of, I would kind of divide the concepts of wilderness and concepts of nature and take the kind of problematic duali dualities that the concepts of nature has and move it to wilderness and let wilderness do all of that. But then when I, for example, talk about restoration, I talk about nature and not wilderness stuff. But I think we still need to keep it. So because I think it has this very high amount of value and I think it should keep on having the high amount of value because it's extremely rare. Is, is that, does that answer your question? Is that? Uh, yeah, I think so. The, the only other thing would be then, um, and I don't, know, I don't want to take up too much time here, but um, also where that sort of, justification for having a giving nature a moral value comes from because often like our value systems are human centric and we say this is valuable because to a sentient being whatever it has you know it benefits them um 
and obviously you know you can you can describe that to other animals as well but you know what what sort of how are you justifying that you know saying that nature is intrinsically valuable oh yeah yeah uh yeah so uh there you usually kind of you can well with obviously animals it's uh kind of straightforward because we can kind of imagine <laughs> the way kind of like humans are you can um kind of justify because um like for example um an animal when you hurt it or produce harm to it or plants or any kind of living entity you can see that you produce harm and as soon as you produce harm you usually go into the moral territory area so that's when um or at least you can start making these moral arguments or trying to justify these moral arguments when you can see that a thing has been harmed. Whereas with like nature or ecosystem, these things can be quite much more challenging to make. However, you could try and trust, there's been different ways um, of justifying this. So for example, you could go with the arguments that we can see that ecosystems have a good of their own. So so that kind of justifies the intrinsic value of nature because we can say that something can be good for a system ecosystem and therefore it has a good of its own and therefore we can harm it and therefore we can produce moral harm or you can justify it by for example some people claim that it's flourishing of ecosystems so that um Put the moral value in the flourishing or health you could there has been arguments made that you can argue that ecosystems can have health so that's something in a kind of uh, and not necessarily even in the so some say that it's more in a metaphorical sense but we can still kind of make the jump that they are um, ethically uh, valuable from a health like because we can heart we can uh, uh, decrease their health but then also uh, there's a uh, article by Katie McShane where she says that no there's an actual health ecosystem can be in a very literal sense healthy that uh, we can cause harm to their health harm to ecosystem health in a very literal sense so that's where um, our actions towards nature then become immoral because this kind of idea of health has intrinsic value to us. Um, other ways are, for example, uh, yeah, flourishing is one way, uh, which we, yeah, there's a whole host of ways <laughs> that you can then include moral arguments. But yeah, I'm, I'm at the moment, I haven't quite, yeah, that's one thing that I'm at the moment deciding, which is the most, um, with my rights of nature paper because I, I do need to take <laughs> take a stand on that. So I'm at the moment in this maze of literature trying to decide which is the most convincing pathway. But yeah, but usually it's made from that kind of those intrinsically valuable things that we consider in humans usually. So for example, like health and um, good of your own or your interests or uh, suffering or something like that. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question? Um, yes, uh, Stephen Middleton. I'm um, I'm a retired geoscientist. And apologies for the picture. Um, I didn't know that would be there. Um, thank you. It's fascinating. Um, I ask a question about time. Mm -hmm. How do you morally value the time that's been lost with respect to the composite of damage, and how and whether you should value it, and in which direction? Who you know? And, and how much? Do you mean? Oh, well, you lose time is loss. Mm -mm, yeah. If an ecosystem is destroyed. That's a loss of time. And the yeah. implication I have is, how do you value that morally, and uh, uh, and in other ways, and in which direction do you, does the value go? And oddly, should it be us that's being owed nature that we've lost? In mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a really interesting one. I've. I have to say, this is the first time that this has come up. I don't think that, I, I, at least to my, what I've read so far, the time question, the time question in the sense of time lost, I don't think, I'm not sure if that's... I'll add to it as well. There is a timing yeah. aspect, that the loss could be greater or less in respect to the timing of the ecosystem loss. So there is time yeah. and timing. Yeah, 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 that's really fascinating. 
I have to, yeah, that's something I definitely need to, yeah, think about. That's really, really good question. Like there's obviously, in the literature, there's obviously discussions over time and like what time do you then restore the, like in what time in the past do you kind of try and restore the systems of this discussions like that. But there's, I, I don't think I've seen anything with regards to like trying to compensate for the time that has been lost. And the last thing is time scale, that the yeah. elements of the ecosystem have different time scales. So yeah. for its period of destruction, it's relevant to some and not others. Mm. Time frame. So there's an interesting time as a, a measure of value in nature is multidimensional to me. Sorry, I'm, I'm slightly wandering. Yeah, yeah, that's really you, fascinating. Thank you. That's me really there with this um, event. Yeah, I have to. Yeah, I have to. I have to admit that I don't have a good answer for you at the moment because you've. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I haven't uh, actually thought about it from this perspective. So thank you very much for raising uh, the issue. Well, this is something I definitely need to <laughs> do some a lot of thinking about. Okay, thank uh, you. I think it can certainly. I can see. Yeah, that it could I have. Great, it's more, but I don't think you'd want that. And it's certainly, I think the time's run out. The mm. time is a critical aspect of nature. It's missing, it's missed, it's not even misunderstood, it's just not counted. Mm. So many yeah. Ways. yeah. Yeah. I need to look into this. Yeah, certainly. I, I can't <laughs> with you at the moment, but I need to look into this. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. I thought maybe I might ask, there's a question that we didn't get around to asking in the chat from um, Krista from the DTP, who I think is left now. Um, but they, they asked if it's ethically wrong to assign the monetary values to, cons to the conservation of nature. So if it's ethically... If it's ethically wrong or right to assign a monetary value or a price to the conservation of nature itself. Oh, uh, yeah. Um... Yeah, so, so obviously our monetary values are one way that humans tend to, or we tend to value things. So I think that's quite, um, we tend to put monetary value on human life even. However, I think, I think you can put some monetary value on these things. However, if it's kind of, uh, however, if it's completely taken as a monetary value, I think that's where you, I, uh, you get into trouble. So I think we need to remember that there is intrinsic value involved and and like with restoration uh, If we take restoration You could maybe if, if we take a very simple case where we know who has harmed done the environmental harm like I said, they could pay someone else to do the work, but I think where you I don't think we can put the I think just in a kind of similar analogical way that you, we shouldn't put um, monetary value on human life as completely exhaustive of monetary value is very problematic in the same way. I don't think we can put monetary value on nature. However, in some cases, obviously we can measure some of these values in monetary ways, but as long as that's not exhaustive of the intrinsic values, then then I think it can be done, but we need to be obviously careful that we don't. It just doesn't restoration doesn't come like just the transactions of of money. <laughs> Basically, some some restoration must actually happen. <laughs> so sure, yeah, thank you. Um, if no one has kind of more questions and stuff, feel free to yeah, make yourself and, um, and, and chat. But it's almost half five, so I think maybe just like if, if anyone else wants to say anything, yeah, briefly ask a quick question, then otherwise we can, um, we can do it there. Okay, well, it seems like everyone's, <laughs> everyone's quite good out. It's really, really interesting, though, really good to. Um, yeah, to see to, to see a talk, a talk on that topic, which, like I say, I think lots of people here, especially myself, definitely included, don't know, don't know enough about. 
given that we're kind of working in this area, you know, for the time being anyway. So um, really good. And and I think, yeah, we'll try and maybe put together like a really short reading list of sort of, just, you know, headline recommendations because uh, we should, should be aware. Can I thank you, Chris? Again, yeah. this is the first one I've come to on this and um, I'd say you, you've done a great job because without you, things get unstuck. Um, and, um, and also the, 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 the talk. And your voice has gone a little bit muffly. So in the last block of time, you've gone more muffly than you were before. Otherwise, I won't say any more. Thank everybody. Well, thank you, Stephen. That's, 